There's a reason Psalm 23 is the most beloved of all the Psalms. It's because it just reminds us of this incredible reality that God is present and he is our good shepherd. It's so personal. And so we pray that the words of that song have just ministered to your soul today, have reminded you of powerful truths that your life is in the hands of God. Jesus was dead. He had been crucified. His body taken off the cross, and there was no doubt but that he was dead, and his dead body laid in a tomb. And three days later, miraculously, Jesus had risen from the dead. The women saw it first and realized that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead, and they began to spread the word. Just a little later that day, Jesus appears alongside of a few of his disciples. And as he walks alongside them, they are not able to to know who he is. They don't recognize him. Now, it may be because of their grief. It may be because God didn't give them that ability yet. And so Jesus is asking them what they're talking about. And and they begin to tell Jesus about, about himself, about how he had been crucified, handed over to the Roman soldiers by the Jewish authorities and crucified on a cross, how he had been laid in a tomb. And and then suddenly there was this, this rumor that he had risen from the dead, that he was alive. Jesus reveals himself and he says to his disciples, and you see this on the screen, these amazing words in Luke chapter 24, verses 25 to 27. And it really is a powerful expression of why we're doing this series. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. If you have your own Bibles, underline those words. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. What Jesus is saying is that all of the Old Testament points to him. That all of the Bible had proclaimed already that the Messiah would be handed over to the authorities. That his life would be taken from him. He would be crucified. He would be killed. And then on the third day, he would rise again from the dead. He's saying to them, if they understood the scriptures, if they understood the Old Testament, because that's the scriptures that they had at that time, if they understood the Old Testament, they would not be surprised by what they had heard and seen. They would not be surprised that Jesus had been handed over, that Jesus had been crucified, that Jesus had died, that he had been placed in a tomb, and that he had risen again. For the Old Testament had pointed to this moment. It is the great moment in all of history. If you have, are just joining us, we are doing a series called Jesus in the Old Testament. And what we're seeing in this amazing series is that all of Scripture points to Jesus. The Old Testament is but a shadow of the life and the mission of Christ. The New Testament then points back to Jesus and helps us to understand the implications of his life and his death and his resurrection. And so what we are doing in this series is we are looking at the Old Testament and we are seeing how the Old Testament prepared us for the coming of the Messiah, of the Christ, of Jesus, so that when he came, we would recognize him for who he is. And this is our Easter series because as we prepare our hearts for Easter Sunday, we want to understand that all of history came together at this moment. That meaning and purpose and life come together in this moment, these three days, the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. This is what brings life and purpose to each of us. And so we began in the first week, we talked about how Jesus is the second Adam. Where the first Adam failed, the second Adam was victorious. We see in 
in the book of Genesis, how Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. And we saw that sin entered the world. And what the Bible teaches is that as descendants of Adam, that his sin is imputed to each one of us, not just at the moment that we are born, but at the moment that we are conceived. Sin has entered into us. And then we see in the New Testament that the second Adam lived the life that the first Adam did not live, where the first Adam failed and gave into temptation. The second Adam lived a perfect life of obedience. And through his death and through his resurrection, through faith in Jesus, in this Christ, in the Messiah, the righteousness of Jesus is imputed to all who believe so that we are righteous before God, so that we become holy before God. It's an amazing reality that Paul talks about in the book of Romans. The second week, we had David Brickner here. David is the executive director of Jews for Jesus. And he took us through some of the great feasts of the Old Testament. And he showed us that these feasts, all predicted, were just a shadow of the life and the mission of Jesus. It pointed us to Jesus. We'll see more of that next week as we talk about the Passover. But we also see in, in that that in last week, that Jesus fulfilled the great laws that we read about in the Old Testament. We saw the different, the different categories of laws, and we saw that Jesus fulfilled all of the laws through his life. And so, friends, what we're going to see today is another great reality. We see a great theme in the Old Testament as God instituted the sacrificial system. He did that for us. He did that so that we would understand the need for Jesus and we would understand what the death of Jesus means for us. And so let's pray as we begin. Our Father in heaven, we ask that you would give us great insight and great understanding when it comes to the reality that we are going to talk about today. Father, may we come who have faith to to understand at a deeper level what the death of Christ on the cross means for us. May it lead us to great joy and celebration in understanding the incredible love that you have for us. For those who are watching this who don't believe, we pray, Lord, that you would begin to stir in their heart to think about such things, to explore what we're talking about, and to see if it isn't true. Enlighten them, give them eyes of faith, Give them the ability to see and to understand. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to talk about a word this morning. The word is atonement. And what does atonement mean? It simply means that we need to atone for our rebellion against God. Sin in the Bible is seen as rebellion against God. It's the breaking of a relationship. It's more than breaking a rule. It's breaking a relationship because at the heart of sin, as the Bible teaches, is a lack of trust in the word of God, is a lack of trust in the nature of God. And so when we break a commandment, we need to atone for that. And we see this in the Old Testament. We see that we see that when Adam sinned, that the Bible says in the last verse of chapter two of Genesis, that the man and the woman were naked and without sin. It's not just talking about the fact that they didn't have clothes on. What it means is that they were naked, they were vulnerable, and there was no shame. There was no shame. But as soon as they sin, they realize that they are naked because now they are ashamed, the Bible says. It's the result of sin. And so what do they do? They run from God. They hide from God. They they try to hide from each other. They try to hide from themselves. And when God banishes them from the Garden of Eden, we see what I believe is the first sacrifice. God sacrifices an, an animal, and he then clothes them with the skin of that animal to cover them, to cover their, their shame. And then we see, as we go through the Old Testament, that God institutes different sacrifices so that we had something that we could do to atone for our sin. 
so that when we sin and we feel that shame, we are something real and tangible that we can do to restore our relationship with God. It's not that God has moved. It's that we have turned our backs on God. And this is a way that we could be restored. And what we see here on the screen is that in, in the Old Testament, an atonement was really, it was a covering for the purpose of being reconciled, of being made right with God. Remember, our natural tendency, as we saw with Adam and Eve, is to hide because of our shame. And when we atone for our sins, God covers us and in such a way that we are reconciled to him. He covers our sin so that we are reconciled to him. Now, in the Old Testament, there were many different sacrifices, and you see those on the screen. We see the burnt offering, which we're going to talk about here this morning. We see the grain offering, the fellowship, or it's often called the peace offering. We see the sin offering, which we're going to talk about as well today, and the guilt offering. But I want to focus, because of time, specifically on the burnt offering and the sin offering. These are very similar to each other. They're very similar. But where they are different is very significant. So I'll explain some of the differences as we go along. But as we look at the Old Testament, we want to begin with this. What was the necessity? What was the necessity of the sacrifice? Why did they have to offer a sacrifice? It was because of their sin. Listen to what we read in Leviticus chapter 5. I'm sorry, chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because the Lord your God is holy. He says, Because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Let me read that again. It's so profound. Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. What does that mean? It means that God is perfect in every way, in every action, in every inaction, in every thought, in every motivation. He is perfectly pure. Now, the problem is, as I mentioned, because the sin of Adam was imputed into us, it's our sinful nature to rebel against God. And so we are incapable of being holy as God is holy. He calls us to be perfect in every way, but you and I have failed already today. We have failed to love God in the way that we should love God. We have failed to love one another in the way that we are called to love one another. We have failed in our thought life, in our motivation. Even when we do good things, our motivations are often really confused. Yes, we're doing it for God, but we're doing it for ourselves as well. Yes, we're doing it for our neighbor, for our family, but we're doing it often for ourselves as well. And so that lack of purity requires atonement. We have to atone because we are not perfect as God is perfect. I want to give you a picture of this. This is a picture of oil and vinegar. Now, this doesn't surprise you. We've probably all done this. We've tried to mix uh, dressing for a salad. We see that the, the vinegar and the oil don't mix. You see there that the oil is not able to penetrate to the vinegar, and the vinegar is not really penetrating the oil. Each is remaining separate from the other. I want you to imagine that there's just one, one um, drop of, of the vinegar there. And what we see is that it's not mixing together. To be holy, imagine that the world is the vinegar and holiness is the oil. As we live our lives, we are to live perfectly holy, not allowing the darkness of the world to affect the way we think, the way we live, what we do and what we choose not to do. What happens is, in our world, it mixes together into our lives in such a way that often we can't distinguish. And that's why the world often looks at Christians and say, well, you're no different than we are. And yet we are to be transformed. We are to be significantly different as a light, as a sign to those in our world of their need for Jesus. And so what we see, first of all, is that the need for a sacrifice is to atone 
because we have failed to be holy, perfect, set apart in, in perfection as God is. We come to the second point I want you to see from the Old Testament perspective of the sacrificial system, and that is this, the role of the, of the worshiper, the role of you and me. When we offer a sacrifice, it's recognizing our need for sacrifice and for forgiveness. When we are offering a sacrifice in the Old Testament, it's because we understood that we have failed to live as God called us to live. So as the worshiper, we're, are, we are seeking to atone for that sin. So we read, for example, in Leviticus chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you are to offer a male without defect. You must present it at the entrance of the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. There's a lot there that I want you to see. This is a profound picture. Now, notice this is a burnt offering. In a moment, I'll describe how it's uniquely different from a sin offering, but it's very, very significant. I want you to notice a couple of things, that the animal to be sacrificed was an animal that was perfect. It was an animal that had no blemish. That makes sense, doesn't it? Now think about somebody who's going to offer a bull to, as a sacrifice to the Lord. They go out to their flock and, or their, their, um, their bulls and they, and they grab one. They said, you know, this one's not worth quite as much money. I can't get as much money if I sell that bull. So I'm gonna offer that bull as a sacrifice. So they take the bull, the worshiper takes the bull and brings it to the priest. The priests have to approve the sacrifice. And they notice that this bull is, is not in great shape, that it's, it's, got, it, it's gimpy, it's not walking right, it's, it's kind of dragging one of its legs. They would never allow that sacrifice. The reason being is we don't give God second best, we give God the very best because sin is serious business. And we're not going to offer to God something that is, that is defective. And so what they do is they, they pick the animal that is most perfect, that does not have blemish. The second thing I want you to see in this is that the people had no way to deal with the sin on their own. Think about this. The offense is against the Lord God Almighty. The offense is against God. And so... In order to appease God, we have to respond in the manner in which God has dictated because our offense is against him. And the way that he has called us in the Old Testament as a worshiper to deal with our sin, he called us to deal with our sin by offering sacrifices to him. These burnt offerings or these other offerings that the, the scriptures allowed the people to give to him because of their sin. And so God has prescribed it. And so we follow God's plan and his purpose. Third thing that I want you to see is that one of the problems was that these sacrifices just, they just went through the motions. They just went through the motions after a while. It just became part of their life. We've got to grab the best from our flock if it was sheep or or the best, or whatever it was that they were offering as, as a sacrifice. And then they would bring it and they would offer it, but their hearts were a million miles away. You see, it was never God's intent that this would be the end of the sacrificial system. Because as we'll see in a moment, this could not accomplish what God wanted to accomplish. Something deeper and more profound had to happen. This was just a shadow of God, what God would do in the New Testament. And so I want you to see David's heart because David sees this. And I want you to hear his heart in Psalm 51. He says, you, O God, do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. You see, David probably didn't fully grasp, but he had a deeper understanding of what was coming. 
He understood that the sacrificial system as it pertained in the Old Testament was just a shadow of what was coming. He was just helping us to understand what was coming. And so he understands that what matters is not just going through the motions of offering a sacrifice, but of being fully present and understanding in the depth of our soul, the, our offense against God, and to have a broken and contrite spirit with regard to our sinfulness. Friends, I can't emphasize that enough. So often we just come to worship and we don't engage. We're just going through the motions. We come to the communion table and we just go through the motions. We don't understand the depth of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. When we confess our sins, we just go through our list and our heart is not engaged. David is reminding us that what matters to God is our deep understanding of our affront against God because of our sin and what God has done to atone for that sin. This is a profound reality. And the last thing I want to mention about the burnt offering, and this is amazing. Notice in Leviticus chapter one, the worshiper puts their hand on the animal. Why would they do that? Now in the, in the sin offering, they don't. The, the priest takes care of everything. But in the burnt offering, they put their hand on the animal before the animal is sacrificed. Why would they do that? They do that because they are identifying with the animal. They are trying to identify with the animal because their sin is being poured out upon this animal. Their offenses against God is going upon this animal. This animal is receiving the sin of the worshiper. So when I touch and put my hand on the back of that bull or on the head of that lamb, what I'm doing is I'm identifying with that animal as best as I could with an animal, understanding that my sin is being given over to the animal. It's an amazing picture, as we'll see, of the sacrifice of Jesus, where the sacrificial system was, was, was not enough is that these were animals. We, we are not an animal. We are made in the image of God. And so what it would take is for another made in the image of God to stand in our place, to be the one that we really can identify with. Because like us, he was tempted in every way and yet without sin. It's amazing to see how the scriptures come together. The next thing I want you to see is the role of the sacrifice, the role that the sacrifice itself plays. And here, what we see in Leviticus chapter 5, verse 10 is this, the priests shall then offer the other as a burnt offering in the prescribed way and make atonement for them for the sin they have committed and they will be forgiven. And so what happens is, they follow the prescribed manner that God has given to us. Why? Because again, it's against God that we need to atone. It's against God that we have sinned. And so what happens is we, the animal then stands in our place and the animal is sacrificed. Now, when we look back on that today, I know that for many of us, it just seems gruesome. It seems just heartless. It seems like a, just a, a terrible time in history. And people often who do not understand all of this and how it all ties together, it makes no sense to them. Why would God do that to innocent animals? I want to show you a picture that can stir our hearts. This is a worshiper and a, a coming before the priest with their, with their lamb without blemish. You see the fire burning. The animal is about to be sacrificed on that altar. Now that seems from our human perspective to be gruesome. It does. And there's reason for that, which I'll mention in a moment. But I want you to imagine these thousands of sacrifices being offered. I want you to imagine the stench that is going up into the atmosphere. You can smell it. You can hear the animals. You, it, it's a terrible thing. And the reason for all of that is so that we would understand how serious sin is 
and that a sacrifice is absolutely necessary. It's an extraordinary reality that God is reminding us that a sacrifice is necessary because sin is serious business. Our rebellion against God is a serious business. As Jesus said, if we love him, we'll do what he has commanded. It says that in John 14. So if we are disobeying God, we are saying to God, we don't love you. We're not going to follow you. We're not going to give our lives for you. We're going to live for ourselves. And it comes then to the last point here in the Old Testament that we're going to see. And that's the role of the priest. The role of the priest was the mediator between God and his people. That was their role. In a moment, we're going to see that Jesus becomes the great high priest. But the priest would stand bef- between the people and God and offer sacrifices not only on behalf of the people, but on behalf of themselves, because they too are sinners. So even though they're standing between the people and God, they too are sinners. And before they can offer a sacrifice on behalf of the people, they have to offer a sacrifice for themselves. Look what it says in uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 17. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. In other words, God have mercy on your people. And so the priests stand between a sinful people, even though they too are sinners, and offer sacrifices to atone for their sins and the sins of the people. That was their role. Now, let's go to the New Testament. And we see a different understanding of atonement. In the Old Testament, atonement was a covering. But in the New Testament, we see that that shadow of the Old Testament, we see the picture clearly in the person of Jesus. Listen to what the New Testament understanding of atonement is. It's the work that Jesus did in his life and death to reconcile us. Again, it's about reconciling us to God once and for all so that we all may be saved. All who put their faith in Christ may be saved. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27. Unlike the other priests, okay, they're comparing Jesus to the priests. Unlike the other priests, Jesus does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for, and for all when he offered himself. So we're already seeing the significance. The Old Testament sacrifices were a shadow and Jesus would fulfill the sacrificial system. And here we see that no longer are sacrifices necessary. No longer do we need to offer these animals to the Lord. Why? Because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice once and for all. We'll see that very quickly. Let's look at this. First of all, the necessity of the sacrifice. What's the necessity of the sacrifice? Again, like in the Old Testament, it's our sin. The necessity, the need for a sacrifice is again, just as in the Old Testament, it's because of our sin. We read in Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 22 and 23, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no difference. All of us have failed to live the life that God created us to live, all of us, except Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ lived a life, lived a life in full and complete obedience to the Father. He fulfilled in himself all the commands of God. He lived in perfect love with the Father and perfect love of people. He lived the perfect life we could not live. And so it takes us to the second point, and that is Jesus becomes the sacrifice. Now, again, it's not a sacrifice that has to happen over and over and over again. For Jesus is very different than the sacrifices of the Old Testament. He fulfills all of that. Listen to what we read in Romans 3, verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, atoning for our sins, through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. I mean, that is an absolutely significant, significant reality. 
And then we read in Hebrews 9.22, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Now, I want to compare, and I want to show you how Jesus is the fulfillment as the sacrifice of the entire Old Testament sacrificial system. Listen to this. We see throughout the New Testament that Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God, sometimes called the perfect Lamb of God. Why is he called the Lamb of God? Because he, was, he lived to die in our place on a cross where the lamb would be offered, most often, more often it was a lamb that was offered for the sins of the people. And what you offered depended on your income category. Jesus was that lamb of God that was, was crucified, that died in our place. He is the perfect sacrifice of God because he was not an animal, but he was fully God and fully man. So he could stand in our place where an animal could not stand in our place. We also see that Jesus was the unblemished lamb of God. Remember in the Old Testament, the animal could not be blemished. Jesus was unblemished because he was without sin. Jesus was perfect in every way, in every thought, in every action, in every inaction, in every motivation. In every, everything that went through his heart and mind, Jesus was unblemished. He was perfect. So he's the only one who could stand in our place. I could not stand in the place of my children, for I too am a sinner. You could not stand in the place of those you love, because you too are a sinner. Only Jesus Christ, the unblemished Lamb of God, could stand in our place. And Jesus shed his blood. I just read in Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. In the Old Testament, we learn that blood represents life. We also read in Leviticus, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So why would God allow the shedding of the blood of all these animals? Because it was preparing us for the blood of Christ that would be shed on that cross on Calvary. That blood that would bring the forgiveness of sin to our lives. He was the fulfillment of all that happened in the Old Testament, which was a mere shadow of what Jesus would do for us. And we are so blessed to live on this side of the cross because we can see the Old Testament shadow and we can see how Jesus is the perfect, is the perfect one to fulfill all that was done in the Old Testament. It's extraordinary. And so the blood of Jesus was shed on Calvary for us, blood represents life. The life of Jesus was lost, was given so that we might have life. We also read on and we see that Jesus is our great priest. He's not, he's not just our sacrifice. He's our great priest. Remember the role of the priest is to stand between the people and God. Jesus stands between us and God, with his hands held out, his crucified hands, his crucified feet, his, 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 his ravished body on, our, on behalf of us. God did for us through his son what we could never do for ourselves. And so Jesus was crucified. He was crucified for us so that when we believe in him, he becomes the great high priest through whom we can have relationship with God now and forevermore. He is the one who is the great high priest. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 10. Day after day, speaking of, of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, speaking of Jesus, when this priest has offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he is made perfect forever 
those who are being made holy. Who are those that he has made perfect forever who are being made holy? Who are those? All who have put their faith in Jesus. All who put their trust in what God did for us through Jesus Christ. Friends, when God looks at us, he sees us as holy not because of our religious rituals, not because we're relatively better than our neighbor, not because we go to church or or send money into the church. It's because we believe in Jesus Christ, that he is the Messiah, that all of history hinges on him, that all of the Bible points to him, that he is everything that we have proclaimed today. And then finally, What is the role of the worshiper? The role of the worshiper. We read on in Hebrews 10. Therefore, because of all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ, because of everything that he has done for us, listen to this. Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let me just quickly break this down. Therefore, because what Christ has done for us We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. What is the most holy place? It represented the presence of God. The most holy place was the most holy place in all of Israel. And you and I, the average person could never go in there. Only the chief priest can go in there one time a year on the Day of Atonement. And even then, the fear was that he would be consumed by the holiness of God. But now, because of the blood of Jesus, we can have fellowship with God. We can have a relationship with God. Now, we don't have to wait until we die. Now, the moment we believe. So he says, because of that, let us draw near to God. Let's not run from hide from God anymore. We don't need to. Let us draw near to God with a a sincere heart, with the full assurance that faith brings. Trusting what Jesus did for us. And he says, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Remember why Adam and Eve hid from God? It was because of their guilty conscience. It's because of their shame. Jesus has dealt with that. We don't need to run anymore. Let us hold, therefore, unswervingly to the hope that we profess, which is the gospel that we've proclaimed this morning. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. If this is what God has done for us, let us love God, let us love one another in ways that the world would never understand. Friends, this is the gospel. I want to close with this story. It's one that some of you have heard. Back in March of 2018, some of you will remember that terrorists in France took a number of people hostage in a French supermarket. And the lives of these hostages were at risk. They were going to be killed. A French officer offered to trade places with a hostage during that standoff. He said to the hostage takers, let me stand in his place. Let me stand in that person's place. Let me sit where they are sitting. Let me stand for them. And because he offered this, and the, host- and the hostage holder said yes, this French police officer was killed. He died. And the hostage w- had been released. And this hostage survived and had life. Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross, he stood in your place literally. And he stood in my place literally. Jesus is not the one who should have hung on a cross. You and I should have. And our sins were poured out upon him. What's interesting in the story of this police officer is that the world and and the French people were amazed that he would do this. Why would he do this? 
It made no sense. Why would he offer himself for another? Who would do that? Well, this pastor, this pastor, because he was a believer, said this. It seems to me that only his faith can explain what we see as the madness of his sacrifice, which today is the admiration of all. He understood, as Jesus told us, that there is no greater love than to lay down our lives for one another. He knew that if his life belonged to his wife, the police officer, if he knew that if his wife belonged to his wife, it also belonged to God. It also belonged to France and to his brothers in danger of death. And the pastor ends by saying this, I believe that only a Christian faith animated by an understanding of God's goodness and charity, could ask for this superhuman sacrifice. As great as this sacrifice was, it pales in comparison to the Son of God taking our sin upon himself and dying a brutal death on the cross. He did it for you. He did it for me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the wonder of the cross. Thank you for the sacrificial system that is but a, in the Old Testament, that is but a, a shadow of what was to come. Father, we thank you for the life that is ours because of what Jesus Christ did for us. And Lord, it's our prayer that all who hear these words would believe, would be driven to their knees in gratitude. And we give thanks and praise and glory to you, to Jesus Christ, to the Father, to the Son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.